Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another episode of the Animal Care Systems Science-Based Webinar Series. I'm your host, Austin Carell. Today's presenter is Dr. Bradley Ahrens. Dr. Ahrens earned his DVM from Western University of Health Sciences and completed his PhD at City of Hope. Dr. Ahrens is the clinical veterinarian at the University of Southern California, head veterinarian for Universal Studios, and consulting veterinarian and research collaborator for several zoos and animal organizations. Animal Care Systems is honored to host his webinar today. The title of his presentation is Bugs in the Mouse House, Expanding the Use of Arthropods in Biomedical Research. If you have a question for Dr. Ahrens, please use the question pane in the control panel, and we will answer as many questions as we can after the seminar. Dr. Ahrens, Dr. Ahrens the audience is yours. All right, thank you. Austin. Um, okay, guys, so as you said, thank you for that nice introduction. So uh, the title of my talk is Bugs in the Mouse House. Uh, if any of you have ever seen any of my uh, talks before, I tend to concentrate on the weirder animals of the world. Uh, those just tend to be the ones I like, and they're the ones that are a lot more fun to talk about. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get into it. Um, the first thing I want to do is tell you guys who am I and why am I here? <laughs> So Austin did a nice job introducing me. So you guys know who I am, but why am I here? And why am I doing this? So uh, lately and over the past maybe five to 10 years, I've done a lot of research with invertebrates for various things, for venom research. And then more recently, more as uh, advocating for their use as animal models in research. And the reason why I'm here is that I wanna teach you guys today and tell you about some of the research that I've done and these animals, which are very interesting and very cool and represent really useful animal models that I feel like are underutilized in our field. So I'm going to tell you guys a lot about them today, and we're going to get right into it. So the intentions of my talk is I'm not trying to sell you guys on going out and replacing all your mice with, with bugs. I'm not trying to get you guys to fall in love with them or not squash spiders in your house. In fact, if there's a spider in my bed, it's good as dead. Um, and I love lobster as much as the rest of them. So, um, you know, I have no special special place in my heart for you, for using bugs and working with them. I say bugs affectionately when I when I mean arthropods generally. And so my intention today is just to educate you guys about these their uses in research and what we can learn from them. So we're all familiar with the three R's of animal research, right? There's reduce, reuse, and recycle. Um, that's not actually the three R's. Well, the first one's correct. So reduce is the first one. Um, we know that whenever possible, we always want to reduce the animal numbers that we use in research, right? If we can get the same result with 10 animals that we could with 100, it's always favorable, and we always want to reduce those numbers. Second one is refine. If we can do a non-painful method for something that was previously done painfully or improve our research in any way possible, we always want to try to refine it. And then the last one is going to be replace. And that's the one we're going to be focusing on today is that whenever possible, we want to try to replace uh, animals with lesser order species. And we have to be very careful on the terminology we use, such as sentience or intelligence. Um, or even pain. Uh, if any of you have seen, I've done a couple talks at ALAS about pain in invertebrates too. So we have to be very careful when we talk about them, but we do want to, whenever possible, we want to try to replace higher order species with, with lower order species, which are generally considered to be less sentient, but it's not always the case. So when we think of replacement, you know, classically we'll think generally the top of animal research is going to be our primates, our non-human primates. So non-human primates are the closest to people, and you know, with some exceptions, they are, they're obviously the best model for, for much research. And so they're the closest to humans, and so if we're trying to figure out a way to translate a certain drug or a therapy or a surgery into humans, primates are going to be the closest thing to it. But you know, we always want to try to limit our use of primates. They're, they're very smart like us, um, and they, they feel much like we do. So we always want to try to go down the order of species whenever possible. Go down to a dog, then maybe to a rabbit. And now, um, you know, 95% of all research is done using rodents. And even then, and that's all happened within the past, you know, several decades. We used to use a lot more 
larger order species in research and we've really refined and replaced our methods to get down to these species over the years and and now i feel like we can transition even further um, into using more invertebrates and that's what i'm going to be teaching you guys about today so just as a definition of sentience it was in my description of this talk but um, sentience is the ability to feel perceive or experience subjectively and the easiest way to think about it is that the ability to think is reason and the ability to feel is sentience. So whether or not a mouse can feel, we will never really know for sure unless we can somehow find a way to read their mind. But uh, we think for the most part, the community, the scientific community thinks that, that invertebrates do not feel or they will feel less than vertebrate species will. And that's why it is a good reduction replacement to those species. Um, there's always going to be a trade-off for animal models. And so, like I mentioned, uh, a primate is going to be a great model for most research when we're trying to translate to people. But, you know, we, we have to weigh the pros and cons of those. And generally, the, the cons are going to be ethical ones. So if we can get the same result eventually using lesser order species and using fewer animals, we should always do such. Um, just a little bit of history about invertebrates used in research. So they were used back in the 1900s. One of the first people to ever use invertebrates was William Castle. So he studied sea squirts. They're those pretty blue things on the screen. And interestingly enough, they're not invertebrates. They are actually one of the simplest species that has a, uh, that is actually considered a chordate. So he was the first person to ever use Drosophila back in the very, very early 1900s. I think it was 1903 or 1908. And he started his work on that. And one of his colleagues, Thomas Hunt Morgan, who used to study uh, tinophores, which are jellyfish, and then he moved on to sea urchins, he started using Drosophila as well for genetics research. And sure enough, in 1933, he won the Nobel Prize for discovering um, much of what we know today about chromosomes. A little bit of perspective for you guys about publications using invertebrates are that back in the 20s to the 40s, there were only 16 papers published using invertebrate animal models. Since then, the 40s to the 60s, there were 14,000. And then the 60s to the 80s, which is when we learned a lot of what we know today about genetics, uh, they were very popular, most of those being C. elegans and Drosophila. There was around 100,000 papers. There was actually a decrease in the early 2000s to about half of that, and then we've stayed pretty steady since then. Um, if any of you ever worked in a building or in a lab that has Drosophila, you will always know you're in the Drosophila building because they, they get everywhere. They're tiny, they're very hard to control, and they will get out. Um, and that just reminds me of a cute story that the very first invertebrate I ever worked with were, were not quite as innocuous as Drosophila, they were black widows. So my first publication with invertebrates was uh, using black widows, uh, studying the, the toxicity of their bites. And... Sure enough, you know, we had them in very secure containers. We didn't certainly didn't want black widows getting out and they wouldn't let us in the vivarium. And I'm still a little bit bitter about that. And that's why I'm advocating for this today. And that's why much of this presentation today, I'm going to be talking about how that we how we can house these animals in a vivarium, in a traditional vivarium like we all have at our institutions, easily, safely and much like we would with a rodent. And we can make these species more approachable to our researchers. So anyways, I had my black widows. They wouldn't let me into the vivarium because we had no SOPs. We had no precedent for it. So I was doing my research in one of the offices <laughs> in the faculty building. And, you know, I had large black widows and screw top containers and they were very secure. But uh, the thing I didn't think about or the thing I didn't know at the time is that uh, many spiders can store sperm for up to several years. And so those female black widows, they very sneakily impregnated themselves even after being captive for a while. And I started noticing spider webs all over the room. And sure enough, they were the baby black widows that had hatched, crawled out through the air holes and were uh, all over the building. So they still don't know. <laughs> as far as Nobel Prizes go, you know, a lot of people think of invertebrate research as being a precursor to vertebrate research that you would maybe start with a simple model and then over time you would work up to a vertebrate. However, about one quarter of all the Nobel Prizes won in animal research came from invertebrate research. So 
from primary invertebrate research, not using them as segues to other animals. So they, they really do represent good animals and there's a, a, a lot of history for that. Now I'm going to switch into a little bit about some of the invertebrates used in research and what their uses are in research. So this is going to this is kind of general for many of the invertebrates we use in research, and then after that I'll concentrate on the uh, arachnids and the other animals that I tend to use a lot more, and the ones that that my studies are about and arthropods. So. Here's kind of a little chart about many of the arthropods of the earth. Really, they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. The reason I like them is because they're all the cool ones. Spiders and scorpions and centipedes, you know, those are those are the fun ones. Um, and the insects are, are, are all really cool as well. So that was kind of what drew me to arthropods. Um, you know, the non-arthropods are, are fine as well, but, but these have always been the ones I like. And so they were the ones that I concentrated on. So the major type, uh, are going to be your a major type of invertebrates are going to be your mollusks, your arthropods, and your others. As far as mollusks go, we've got cephalopods, gastropods, and bivalves. So our cephalopods, the classic research is the squid giant axon. So if any of you remember from physiology class, the the big giant axon that you hook the electricity to and you can make the muscle contract. So that's the old Hodgkin and Huxley experiment. They won the Nobel Prize in 1963 for for their research discovering that. Um, and then other animals like octopus are very smart and they're used for a lot in behavior and learning experiments. And then cuttlefish, which not only, did you guys know that cuttle bones, the ones you give to birds, those come from cuttlefish, that's their backbone. It's kind of sad, but that's where they come from. Um, but cuttlefish are used a lot in communication and behavior. Uh, next we have the gastropods. Gastropods are gonna be your snails. Gastropods are good for conditioning and learning. They have very simple brains, but they're very smart. And they're actually, it's quite easy to train a slug or a snail to do very basic behavior. Just like Pavlov's dog, Pavlov's dogs, you can do the same experiment in a, in a sea slug and actually get them used to um, doing a certain behavior in response to feeding. And then the last one are the bivalves, which are your clams and oysters and things like that. But uh, those are not used all that much in research. Next ones are the arthropods, my favorites. We've got our chlycerates, which are generally the dangerous ones. That's an easy way to think about it. That's the ones with the fangs. Those tend to be the spiders and scorpions. The next one are myriad pods. Just think of myriad of pods, so lots of feet. So those are your centipedes and your millipedes. Next, your crustaceans, your crabs and crabs, lobsters, crayfish. And the last one, the hexapods, which are your insects. Um, your crustaceans, a lot of those are used for molecular memory and aggression. Um, they, they have very easy to isolate neurotransmitters, so they're used, and they tend to like to fight over, over breeding and over territory, so those are really good for molecular memory and aggression. Um, and then hexapods, like ants, um, are used for a lot of things, and we'll get into those in a second. And last, we have the others. And the others, we have the echinoderms, like our starfish. We have all our different types of worms, and there are a lot of worms on this earth. And then water bears, which are, are the coolest coolest animal. And, we'll, and I'll, I'll tell you just a little bit about those in a minute. So what are they used for? Um, your cephalopods, like I said, the squids are used for their giant axon. The octopus and the nautilus are used for their behavior. And then the cuttlefish are learned for, for memory. Um, one of the nice things about using an octopus is that they're very smart. Or using any cephalopod, they're extremely smart. They can find their way into and out of a jar. They can solve puzzles. They can do really amazing things. Uh, one of the difficulties of using them, and we, we do have some here at USC as well, is that they are very smart. It's, their advantage is also their disadvantage. They are very good at escaping. And many times you'll find an octopus on the floor if you're not careful or if you've built new equipment recently. So your gastropods, like I said, they're good for conditioning, learning, and memory. These, these snails have, have very cool, these shells are very LA. Um, I'm in LA right now, so this uh, reminds me of home. And there are some really pretty gastropods too. So this is a blue sea dragon. This is a really very pretty type of sea slug. Uh, and then there are really adorable ones too. These ones aren't used in research, but they're just kind of cute to show. And next we have our chlycerates. So see that beautiful pair of fangs that you don't want to get bit by? Uh, these are the ones that, that, that I tend to work with. The arthropods, 
So the first one, the Myria stone. So these, when you think of that, you think of horseshoe crabs. And horseshoe crabs are really amazing. So they also won a Nobel Prize for the use of their optic nerves. So they have a very, very large, very easy to isolate. My light just came off. Um, optic nerve. And so they've, they've been traditionally used to study that, but also uh, they do these large collections where they'll scoop up a lot of them and they'll collect their hemolymph and then use that for what's called a limbus amoebocyte lysate test. And that's replaced rabbits. So they used to use rabbits for this test and since then uh, to test toxicity of substances. And now we can use horseshoe crab blood and they're collected and then they're all released back into the wild after, after they draw the hemolymph from them. So our arachnids, arachnids have a lot of really interesting things and these are not exclusive to arachnids, but this is just some of the things that they're used for. So invertebrates and specifically arachnids have a structure called a malpighian tubule. They're really interesting because they're analogous to our kidneys. If you look at the diagram here, uh, you'll see these little black tubes uh, in the middle kind of below that, you guess you don't know many of the structures of a spider if you've never looked at a diagram of the anatomy of one, but they're the little black tubes beneath that red heart and above that giant ovary. And that's what functions as their kidneys. And they're really, they're exquisitely sensitive to different substances. So right now, you know, in the pharmaceutical industry, we use all sorts of mammals for screening toxicity of drugs, not even efficacy, but just making sure they're safe and they're not toxic to certain organs. Well, these guys have many of the same organs that that our mammal friends do, that we use rabbits or rats or mice for screening. And in many cases, the structures in these guys are gonna be even more sensitive to things like toxicity than those. So these would be a great pre-screening method to not only eliminate or reduce the number of mammals that we use for drug screening, but also uh, to save money. Um, these are much, much cheaper and much easier to house, much easier to take care of, much easier to use uh, than, than mice are. So it really would be not only a, a replacement, but also a refinement. Uh, comparative physiology and development. So they have many of the same stem cells and repair mechanisms that we do as well. So especially in things like heart regeneration and heart physiology, they have, they have many similarities to mammals. So they can be used for that as well. Uh, they recently, just a few months ago, they did their first MRI study um, using large bodied animals like spiders. So they used uh, MRIs. Uh, I've done ultrasound in many of these animals as well. Um, and they published that, interestingly, that these guys, that the, their heart rate is not dependent on their body size. So heart rate stays the same, no matter how big they are, or generally the same within a species, but the, their cardiac output will increase with their size. And the last one is oxygen usage. So the reason why we don't have giant bugs roaming the earth like we used to back at the time of the dinosaurs is just not not enough oxygen in the atmosphere because they don't have a diaphragm they don't actively respirate they respirate passively so um, it is another good way to to measure not only oxygen usage but but pollution so here's a here's a cool picture of one of my scorpions um, the next thing is going to be venom so it's kind of a gross picture i won't leave it on it for too long but uh, a lot of the research that's done in these are venom. So here's a picture of me holding a black widow. It's synesthetized lightly. Um, they're still gonna be very slowly moving. Um, as you can see, I have excellent PPE, uh, but there's a reason for that, uh, is that they're, they're so delicate that, that, and I've been bit twice, and both times I got bit by, by black widows was trying to wear gloves and trying to get just the right amount of pressure to hold one and be able to milk the venom. So unfortunately, the only way that you can safely hold these guys and be able to milk them with just the right amount of pressure is to not use gloves. And if you notice, I'm pointing it toward my index finger in, in both these pictures. And if any of you guys can guess why, uh, you can't answer right now, but the reason why you hold them towards your index finger is that anything venomous, when you milk a snake or a spider or anything like that, you hold them towards your index finger because if you're going to lose a finger, you want to use, you want to lose a digit, not a thumb. And so this is this is the the contraption that we made for milking the venom of this spider. Actually, is that you put the fangs into that microhematocrit tube, you use that electrode, and you just ever so gently shock his face, and <laughs> and they'll squirt just a small amount of venom into that tube. So next we have crustaceans. Um, crustaceans are, are really, like I mentioned, they are very aggressive. They like to fight a lot. So 
the molecular mechanisms of that fighting and of that aggression is, is what they're traditionally used for. And you know, for those of you who are thinking, all right, well, sometimes you need a larger model, right? We need a dog, we need a rabbit, we need something like that because we need larger animal. These are coconut crabs. They are a lot bigger than your average rabbit. They're almost the size of that big dog there. So um, we're not really limited by size on a lot of these different species. Don't ever get pinched by one of those. Um, and then last we have the hexapods, which are the insects. There's such a wide range of insects and they have all different adaptations to different environments and everything. Um, the One of the main ones that we use are gonna be ants. So ants have this amazing capability to communicate, problem solve, and they have long-term memory. Look at these ants, they're building a bridge to get over something. That's that's something <laughs> that most of my friends couldn't figure out how to do. So if these ants can do it, there's something there, something that we can learn from it. Um, other things like crickets are amazing in their auditory and their stimulation and their response to an auditory stimulus. This is a Drosophila, basically a Drosophila brain. So they express GFP in the in the neurons of this Drosophila. So you can actually see all, you can see the what's analogous to a brain and you can see all the nerves going down that, that Drosophila's body. Cockroaches. Um, we all love to have them in our house, but in addition to that, they're amazing for toxicity and radiation research. So they're probably this, one, of the, one of the most immune animals to radiation. So if we ever have a World War III, they're, you know, they're, gonna, they're gonna take over. But also they're great for toxicity research. They're pretty hardy. If you ever tried to kill them, they're very difficult to kill. Um, they've learned that over many years. And so uh, many millions, billions of years. So they're, they're good to study for those things. Um, termites, termites are amazing for studying symbiosis of, of their gut microflora. Uh, also <laughs> being a convenient scapegoat for, for, for bad animals. And then, and then we have bees. So bees, there's a lot, Aristotle studied bees many, many, many years ago. Um, they're amazing at their learning, memory, uh, even used to study addiction. So a lot of what we know about uh, cocaine addiction came from studying them in bees and then navigation as well. So these bees, even though they're very sp small and their brains are very tiny, uh, they, they navigate better than most of us do. There are some scary ones. It's just kind of a cool picture of a, of a parasitic isopod that, that, uh, that attaches itself to the tongue of fish. Um, here's your C. elegans. It was the first ever connectome that was that was completely discovered. So connectome is basically the entire neural network of the brain and, and all the nerves of the body. Uh, Manduka are very smart too. They're used for development research. These are your tobacco horned worms. Our, uh, our alligators also like to eat them. Leeches, uh, leeches are used for receptor physiology, especially the acetylcholine receptor. Uh, they're very easy to access and very easy to manipulate in these guys. And then planarians, our flatworms, are basically just one big gut. So they're, they're very useful for studying gut physiology. And last but not least, come our tardigrades or our water bears. Uh, they're one of the, they're, there's a lot of research going on in them right now. They can survive in, in the vacuum of space. You can actually dry them and dehydrate them into a little water bear raisin, leave them for a number of years, put a drop of water on them, and they'll pop back to life and start walking around again. Um, and they're they're almost completely immune to radiation as well. So, and not to mention they are adorable with their little claws and their little sucker face. And then lastly, um, some people do like to keep invertebrates as pets. So discovering more about them can definitely make them uh, more suitable for for pets. And you know, I think a lot of you are thinking, oh my God, why would I possibly want a spider or something for a pet? Well, let's think, why would you want a cat? It's fuzzy, tarantulas are fuzzy. Uh, they live a long time. Well, you know, cats live, what, 10 to 20 years and many tarantulas can live 20 to 30 years. So they live longer and uh, they can be quite cuddly if you, if you train them. <laughs> All right, so now that we kind of know, now that I've introduced you guys to what a lot of these invertebrates are used for in research. Now we're gonna start talking about how we can expand their use in research. Um, there's basically six ways, and these are the six things that we're gonna be concentrating on in the second half of our presentation today. And those six things are gonna be first, the research uses 
um, what they can be used for. And if they can be used for more things, then they'll obviously be used more. The next are procedural. So how we can do procedures in these animals. Uh, you know, many of us don't know how to uh, get blood from a from a praying mantis or getting blood from a lobster. Next is medical. So if we have them in our facilities, right, as veterinarians or veterinary technicians, we need to know how to take care of them. We need to know how to treat them. We need to know what a sick one looks like. We need to know how to put it on a health report, what type of treatments we should do for it. Um, and then that leads us even further into diagnostic, not only for the health of these animals, figuring out what their normal reference ranges are, what's normal for them, how we can tell if they're sick, if we have one that's lethargic, what tests can we do to see what's wrong with it or how we can intervene? Uh, but also very useful for translating to research. If we are testing drugs on these animals, we wanna be able to see how those drugs are affecting their body. So if we can use something analogous to liver enzymes or something like hematocrit, they don't have red blood cells, but if we find analogous diagnostics like that that we can run on these animals to see how they're doing if they're healthy then we can use that to assess how our research is going we can use that further as a research tool um, another one that i'll concentrate a lot on that's very relevant to acs is husbandry um, and we'll get to why that uh, i think many of you saw the flyer is that i used acs caging i used opti mouse caging for most of these species and it was really interesting adapting it to it and so we'll talk a lot about husbandry. And the last one is just advocacy for these animals. If we don't, if nobody knows about it, they're not gonna use them and we're gonna continue to use mammals, continue to use higher order species. And we'd like to change that. At least I would, hopefully you guys would too. So research uses. Um, this brings us to the square peg in the round hole theory is that many times, and I'm sure you all can relate, is that many times, in our institutions, our investigators, our researchers are, are trying to use a model that they're comfortable with. If you have a lab who's used mice for 30 years, even if they're pursuing something different, if they're looking into a different problem, they're looking into a different process, a different area of research, they're comfortable with mice. They've already got the equipment, they've already got the caging, they're all trained on how to restrain them, do injections, so they're gonna try to make that model fit the research. But as you can see from me going through all the uses and all the variety of these invertebrates, which, which I think we'd agree there's a lot more variety to invertebrates than even invertebrates, but nature has figured out a lot, right? All these animals have been around for billions of years longer than we have. And I think they've figured out most things that we're still trying to figure out. So I think a lot of our problems can be solved instead of by trying to take a model that we're comfortable with and adapt it to research that, and try to make that model fit in that, in that round hole, we can take other species that may be better suited for that research and use them instead. Not only will it save money um, and save time, but, uh, but in the case of invertebrates, it'll, it'll save mammal lives. So a quick Google of invertebrate physiology or in invertebrate translational medicine, you'll see the, some of the first, I just, I just Googled this yesterday, and the first things that came up were olfactory responses in cockroaches and microRNAs in plant hoppers. That, that picture there is a plant hopper. It's a, it's a, it's a, a bug that, uh, that attacks rice. It's, it's very devastating. Um, insect models of traumatic brain injury. Uh, we've all seen rodent models of traumatic brain injury. Did you know that there's insect models of it? And that it, many of the things that we're using, many of the things we're studying in those mammals can actually be studied using, using a fly or using an insect. And the last one is air pollutant effects on book lungs. Um, if you've ever been part of any smoking studies or any sort of pollution studies, uh, not only does it make the, <laughs> the room smell really bad, but um, you know, it's not fun for those animals. And if we have, if we have a model that has a lung or something like a lung, a book lung is, is what spiders and a lot of other uh, arthropods have instead of traditional lungs, and they're very sensitive to things like toxins, so they can be a very good screening method for things like air pollutants. Um, the next thing is procedural. So we none of us want to use an animal or use a model that we're not comfortable with. If we were to, if tomorrow one of your institutions were to get a big batch of tarantulas or a big batch of crayfish, 
um, would, would all of you know how to handle them? Would you know how to collect hemolymph samples from them? Would you know how to breed them? Or would you know how to restrain them? Uh, not necessarily. So a lot of it is, um, you know, we need to learn uh, the procedures of these things. Once we get more comfortable with it as, as animal professionals, then we can offer our services to those investigators who are maybe looking into uh, using one of these models, but maybe not be comfortable. And if you guys aren't comfortable with it, they certainly won't be either. And anesthesia. So uh, I did a lot of research on anesthesia in these guys, which, which I'll present to you right now. So many of these animals, especially arthropods, a lot of them are venomous. <laughs> and they're pretty fast too. So it's difficult to work with them when they're awake. And so a lot of the procedures that you're going to be doing on these animals, they need to be anesthetized for. And so what I did is I studied a variety of different anesthetics, trying to figure out what is the best way to do it. Is it best to restrain them, inject with something like ketamine to get them to be anesthetized? Or what about vaporized isoflurane or sevoflurane or Valium? Uh, what drugs work on these guys to get them to have a good plane of anesthesia and a workable amount of time of anesthesia as well. So what I found is that comparing, first of all, the injectable ones were not very easy because <laughs> the first thing you have to do is restrain a scorpion and try to stay away from the, the, the pointy end of it. And once it's restrained, you have to try to give it an injection into its heart which is logistically very difficult and very dangerous to do. So it's a lot easier to put them into a chamber and knock them out with a vaporized anesthetic. And so comparing the three common vaporized anesthetics, we can see very clearly here on this chart that, that the first one in the black bars is halothane. If we use halothane at, at any percent, three, five, or seven, we get somewhere between 30 minutes to an hour of anesthesia. It's a perfect amount of time to do what you need to do. Um, if you do need to just do an injection or something much shorter, you use isoflurane, and then the different concentrations of that will get you about five to 15 minutes. And then sevoflurane is very short, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but even this, we kind of get an idea of, of which drugs would be useful for them. Um, and then it's trying to figure out what percentages, right? Because we know that in most our rodents, we use one to 5%, but what percent do you use in a scorpion or a praying mantis or a tarantula? So these were the four, uh, major groups of animals that we used in this study. And we found that uh, the percent of the anesthetic that we used as that increased, actually the duration of anesthesia decreased. They fell asleep faster. If you put them in a chamber and you use 15%, they'll fall asleep a lot faster, but they'll wake up faster as well. So we found that the lower concentrations, which conveniently can be delivered by uh, a vaporizer, were actually the best concentrations to get uh, workable durations of anesthesia. Also, if we look at the weight of these animals, you'll see the x-axis of these are weight. Um, in all four of these different types, we see that the heavier they get, the longer they sleep. And that you know, can be reasoned that they're gonna get more in their blood and it's gonna take them longer to passively get that out of their, out of their hemolymph and, and, and get fresh oxygen to replace it. Um, next, we look at the duration of anesthesia versus the induction time, and we can see that the longer that they stay in the chamber, the longer that they sleep, which, which stands to reason, but that is different than what you would think of with a mammal. Um, certainly in mammals, if they're under anesthesia for a long time, it will take them a long time to recover, but it's not necessarily from their blood gas coefficient. However, in these animals, since they respirate passively, that is going to definitely be a time component to how much that concentration gets into their into their hemolymph and how long it takes for it to passively leave. And then last to further reinforce the previous figure is just showing that if we leave them in the chamber for longer, um, this would be the induction chamber. If we leave them in for longer, they will sleep for longer. So if we give them an additional three, five, seven minutes of anesthesia, they will uh, continue and even give you up to an extra 15 minutes of anesthesia if you leave them in the chamber for a little bit longer. So all those things taken together, so we now know that if we need about 30 to 60 minutes of, of anesthesia, halothane is great. Use it between, and it depends, and you know, the publication will show the different concentrations which are ideal for the different species, and I've actually made a recommendation for which concentrations to use in which species, and you can use that to write an SOP, which we'll talk about SOPs shortly, to guide you guys 
in how to anesthetize these to get a certain amount of time for your anesthesia. So moving into the next section is medical. How do we take care of these animals? How do we monitor them? What do we do to them when they're sick? Um, so the major areas that we look into these, one are diseases. Very little is known about what diseases these guys get. Um, so looking into that, we don't know if they get uh, viral diseases. We certainly have isolated some parasitic diseases and they're, and they're published, but as far as what viruses and what bacteria are pathogenic to many of these species, we know very little about. So we need a lot more work in that area. Drugs is something that I've been working on and other groups have been working on as well. Not only like in the picture, we see a vial of morphine, not only for things like analgesics, but also like antibiotics or steroids. What, what drugs can we give that we have available that can help improve the health of these or be able to use them to treat diseases in these species? which would then further their use as, as animal models and even allow us other avenues to research these because we can do interventional studies as well. Um, so doing the, testing the blood in these, I, I say blood, they don't actually have blood, they have hemolymph. Uh, so they don't have red blood cells, they just have uh, hemocyanin, so they have a different protein carrier that transports oxygen through their blood. And nobody's really published what we can use for chemistry. We know that their blood is, their hemolymph is fairly similar to that of, of mammals, other than not having red blood cells. And they have different white blood cells than we do. But what can we actually use a chemistry machine that we would use in a veterinary clinic or in a program? Can we use one of those to, to assess health in these animals? And sure enough, we did look at the hemolymph of many of these species, and we, we found reference ranges. So we used several hundred animals for this study, all different shapes, sizes, species, locales, heavy-bodied versus light-bodied, and we found reference ranges in all of those different areas. So we those are all separate. I'm not gonna bore you with all those charts because that's definitely something that you would find in the back of a, of a reference book, because it would be something you would just pull, pull open that book to check the reference to see what your values are on these animals. But as you can see, things like albumin, protein, phosphorus, calcium, they're, they're just, there's normal ranges in these animals, just like any other animal. And we can use that to assess their health. And not only assess their health, but assess their health status for the, for the purposes of research. Diagnostics also. So here, here's another perfect example of my excellent PPE. We, you know, diagnostics, even things as simple as measuring them and weighing them and finding out uh, simple ways to do this. If we're monitoring a study where we're, we're, we're assessing growth or we're assessing weight gain or weight loss in an animal, just easy SOPs and easy ways for us to assess that will make these animals more approachable, not only to us as animal professionals, but at, to researchers. Oh, here we are with the, with the lightly anesthetized black widow and the excellent PPE, and then parasites. So these animals get parasites just like any other animals do. These are some trypanosomes that I found in some of the animals that we worked on. And just because it happened to be at City of Hope at the time, we decided, all right, well, not only is that a really you know, pretty H&E of, of, of these trypanosomes, but we also did scanning electron microscopy of them. You can see them a little bit better there, see them in 3D. And then we even did transmission electron microscopy. And if you look at the middle picture there, you can, you can see the tails in cross section. So it turned out to make some, some very pretty pictures. And we sequenced it and we found out that it's actually a new, new species of parasite that we'll be publishing. So the last but not least and most important to this presentation is gonna be the husbandry. So if you guys haven't seen this picture before, this is the OptiBug. It was an Opti mouse rack that we borrowed <laughs> from the stockpile. At, and this was this all this research was done with, with the Opti bug. This rack was all done at City of Hope. And so we took an Opti mouse rack and traditional Opti mouse cages and we did a little bit of retrofitting to them and made them into invertebrate housing chambers, not knowing how they would work, not knowing if they would escape. We certainly hoped they wouldn't. 
because uh, my, my job was contingent upon them not escaping and having centipedes in the air ducts or, or spiders in the drains. But uh, fortunately, you know, we, we decided you know there were there were a number of different types of makers of these cages available and we decided to use the the ACS cages and they they ended up working very well so i'm going to talk to you guys about why they worked well the the advantages of them and now you even have somewhere to start if if you have an investigator coming to you that wants to start using these these species you 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 have a a suitable housing i haven't assessed any of the other ones um, that would be a good thing for a future study. See if some of the manufacturers can actually give me different cages. However, we'd have to have racks and have them ventilated, um, which which would be a lot of a lot of work and a lot of expense. So housing conditions are the thing that we spend most of our day thinking about and worrying about and recording. So um, one of the first things we had to consider when when housing these species were room conditions. So temperature would be uh, one of the main ones, temperature and humidity. So we can't modulate the temperature within each individual cage unless we were to put some type of heater in that cage, but we could certainly modulate the humidity by either having them ventilated, having the rack ventilated or not ventilated. And then if we put any supplemental water in there, if we put a water bowl, if we misted the enclosures, if we did anything like that, or if we just did nothing, if we want it very dry and arid, we can, we can hook it up to ventilation, not put any extra water, and even make sure to take the Lixit off, because we found that even having the Lixit on the cages would, would increase the humidity of those cages. And the coolest part of it all is that some of the tarantulas and some of the scorpions even figured out how to go and use the Lixit. I would find them with their little faces pressed up against it. I don't think they quite figured out how to, how to move it, but they would, they would plant their faces right on it and the, uh, and, lick the water off of the Lixit. So room conditions are important. Also lighting. Luckily, you know, a 12-12 cycle is good for most of these animals. Uh, bedding types was another thing that, that has to be addressed because the species that we use, we used a plethora of different species and they all come from different areas. Some of them come from forested areas. Some of them come from deserts. Some of them live underground and need to be able to burrow. So we used a variety of bedding types. The main, the four bedding types that we used were coconut husk, we used bark, we used Santa chip, and we used corn cob, uh, depending on the amount of humidity we wanted and depending on the species and what type of substrate they normally were on. Oh, and sand. So the very arid desert species we used, we used sand. Um, housing density was another thing to consider, just like with our with our other animals, with our vertebrate animals, we have to decide whether these animals are social species or not. And some are and some aren't. So even within a, a genus, you'll have different species that are social or asocial. So you need to know which ones are which, and, and that will also affect your humidity, will affect your temperature, because those animals are going to be moving around in the cage. They're going to be creating moisture. And so, you know, you have to account for that. Next is feeding. Uh, all of the species that, that, that I used all eat live food. So that's another thing you have to consider is that where you're going to keep the food. And then even if these animals are fairly large, you have to think about, well, the food is very small. Can the food escape through a filter or through a crack in the lid or through the, the, the door for the Lixit? Um, and then last is, is care staff. <laughs> how, do you train your, how do you train your staff to do these? So at City of Hope, we had our staff doing spot checks, just like with, we do with our rodents. So they would go in there every day, um, even on the days that I wasn't there, and they would check every cage with the flashlight and make sure they all looked healthy. If there was one that was unhealthy, they would put it in for health report, just like, just like a mouse or a rat or any other animal. And then I would go in and I'd assess the animal to the best of my ability, Right? There's not really very much precedent for that. And then figure out if, if there was anything I could do, like give intravenous fluids. Uh, I use venous lightly. Well, they do have veins. They don't have arteries. Um, and just figuring out ways that, uh, that we can have them cared for. And then how to clean the cages, how to make sure there weren't any residual food left in the cages. And uh, a big logistical thing is, is changing them. So we'll talk about that. Um, so here's here's a picture of one of our setups, one of our, our Opti setups. 
And we see here that we've got, this is a flat rock scorpion. Uh, we left the food hopper in, uh, and I'll, I'll show you some more pictures in a second why, but the scorpions loved to be underneath it. That was their favorite place. They really didn't like the PVC tube. They very rarely went in there, but they loved to kind of squish themselves. They would kind of dig a little burrow and they'd squish themselves right underneath that, that food hopper. And that was always their favorite place to be. Most of them were too big to get inside of it, but they loved to, to be under it. And when you look at this cage, you'll notice is that the front, the front of the cage is lighter color than the rest of it. And that's because with the airflow, these were, these were ventilated. Um, with the airflow, you'll see that the, the front of that substrate, this is the coconut husk bedding, because this particular scorpion lives in a more, um, more soil type habitat, more in the jungles. And you'll see that the front of that cage is drier than the rest. The rest of that substrate is moist because we were misting it because this particular species likes higher humidity. But you can see is that that area was drying out. So that's another thing you need to consider when you're thinking about the husbandry of these species is that, uh, is that bedding gonna dry out? How quickly is it gonna dry out? And what do you need to do to keep, uh, to keep the humidity proper? Oh man, my light went out again. And I showed you, as I showed you in that last slide too, we would keep these uh, hydro thermometers that would uh, not only uh, test the humidity, but also the temperature within the cages so that we could change it if we needed to. Uh, here's, <laughs> here's a pink toe tarantula. Uh, these particular, we had maybe 10 pink toe tarantulas. They're, they were very cute and very small and they have very sticky feet. And they loved to be, for some reason, this particular species loved to be inside the food hoppers. They liked to hang out in there. Maybe they felt safe. And what they would do is they'd build a big web nest inside of that food hopper. And it, and it would work out really well because when we would feed them crickets, the crickets would go down. Crickets would either climb or jump up into the food hopper, get caught in the web, and then they would, and then they would eat them out of their little web trap inside the food hopper. Um, we did have some husbandry challenges as well. So one of the weirdest challenges that, that we ran into, and it happened twice in one day, so we actually had two of our giant Vietnamese centipedes die in the same day. And the way that they died is they actually wove themselves through the food hopper and got stuck. And I guess they maybe tried too hard to get out and they ended up dying overnight. And so one morning we came in and we found two that had snaked themselves through that food hopper and had gotten stuck. So for the centipedes, we removed all the food hoppers so we wouldn't have that problem again. Uh, cage cleaning was a problem we ran into as well because Right, many of these animals, in fact, almost all the animals except the praying mantis were venomous. And praying mantis can still pinch you, it doesn't hurt, but it'll, it'll freak you out if you're not used to it. And so cage cleaning, a lot of the issues that we have to worry about with safety. Um, you know, how do you safely get these animals out of the cage so that you can clean it? Um, so for some of the species like the scorpions and the tarantulas, at least for the really mild mannered ones, it was very easy to pick them up and place them uh, into a second, place them into a clean cage, and then we could just send their cage to cage wash. We'd make sure there's no live food left in it because uh, cage wash doesn't want a bunch of crickets running around in there. But um, you you do have to worry about that. However, the centipedes are horribly aggressive and very hard to catch. And of all of the animals, we only ever had one escapee, and it was a centipede, and it escaped on Halloween night. Uh, and I locked myself out of the room and it was uh, it was a big fiasco. But we ended up catching it and everything was okay and I kept my job. <laughs> so training is another big component of working with these animals is that you have to train all your personnel as well as the lab staff, not only in safe handling of these species, but also in how to restrain them, how to work with them, and then what to do if one gets out or what to do if you get bit or something like that happens. Um, we do need uh, protocols and SOPs for that. Uh, one of the things we were really worried about was escape. So on the ACS cages, you know, we know we've got two filters. We've got one in the front and one in the back. And luckily, we never had any, any food, to our knowledge. No crickets ever escaped, and none of the animals ever escaped as well either. So we were very fortunate. And the nice thing about the ACS caging is that they snap on the top, as opposed to something like an Allentown caging, which has the loose top that I'd be worried that some of these animals are very strong. The centipede could easily lift up that top and then snake out and then end up in your kitchen. So there's a lot of work still to be done. Uh, 
right? I only looked at some of these species, um, but there's a lot of other species that we still need to know more about and how to take care of them, how to manage them in the lab and how to house them. Um, also normal versus abnormal. I mentioned that as far as drugs go, but how can we tell uh, what is a normal healthy animal and what's abnormal for an animal as far as behavior, health, disease, everything. And then drug efficacy. It would be really nice if we knew what antibiotics worked in these animals. And that would require a more controlled study where we're actually infecting animals. Well, we'd have to first figure out what pathogens they're susceptible to and then infect them. And then we can see how we can treat them. So, so there is a lot more work to be done to further these species and further their use. Um, and the very last thing is, is advocating. So uh, this was, I, I did a, a talk at ALAS uh, two years ago about pain in invertebrates. And, and that was a good, at, a good opportunity for me to educate people about their uses in research, but also that you know these animals may, may feel pain. So we may need to uh, have more considerations than we currently do for their use in research. Um, and then publish. If, if any of you have these type of species at your, at your institution, even minor things like, like husbandry challenges or what type of caging you use, or if you have some get sick and you find out that if you add something to the water or if you gave them something that they got better, those things are very useful for furthering these animals and furthering their use. You know, 50 years ago, we weren't, you know, there wasn't even that much mouse research being done and we didn't know which viruses or bacterial diseases or anything of, of, of mice there were or, or much about how to treat them. And over the years, we've learned everything that we know about those because we've shared our knowledge and the people that, and the institutions that had rodents would share what they knew and, and, and we would learn about it and how to treat them. Uh, I'm working on an ALAS learning library module. So we've got to think of the logistical barriers to this. So if we have a, a group that says they want to start using these species, what do we do? The first thing we have to train them, right? We train all our animal users. Well, if there's an ALAS learning library module on safety and biology of these of these animals, then you know we can, you know, having an ALAS learning library to train those already is a big step. So that's a big check off our list. Euthanasia guidelines, right? We have guidelines for all our other species that we use. So if we have guidelines for, for these animals, we need that in order to know how to properly euthanize them and even how to read an IACUC um, if your IACUC chooses to cover these species, which um, in my experience, I find about half institutions will, will include invertebrate research on their IACUCs, usually not Drosophila or C. elegans, usually the more advanced species, but they will include those in IACUCs or at least a memo to the IACUC saying that it's being done. And the last one, and a very important one, one that I'm working on a lot, is SOPs. So creating SOPs for cage changing, creating SOPs for health monitoring, creating SOPs for cage wash and cage setup in these species uh, are important for that we can share. And once we have standard SOPs, it makes these animals a lot more approachable because we don't have to reinvent the wheel if your institution doesn't have experience with it. We don't have to reinvent the wheel, write all these things. We can use what other people have used as far as what caging, like what caging I used. We know ACS works well. Other caging might work, but we don't know. Uh, what caging works, what enrichment items are good for them? What humidity, um, how did we keep them at a proper temperature or proper humidity? So those are all good things to have already written down that will make them more approachable and a lot easier to use. So wrapping up, you know, we talked about the three R's and you know, as, as research moves, so should we. You know, we've kind of settled in a place where we, we hold mice to be the simplest. You know, we have a lot of, of really cool in vitro things now, our, our research into cell work and even uh, uh, organisms on a chip that have small little livers and kidneys for assessing drugs are amazing. But in many cases, a, a live animal and a, a simpler order species would be perfect, would be the perfect medium for that, for reducing our mammal numbers or our vertebrate numbers, but also still allowing us to do large scale screening and things before we have to translate into species that are more like us. Um, we talked to, about the invertebrates that are used in research. You guys learned a lot about octopus and cuttlefish and about all these weird animals that you probably never knew were even used in research and what some of them are used for. Um, we talked about expanding the role in research and how we can 
further the use of these animals and what they can benefit us in. Um, and then last, we talked about establishing standards and allowing the increased use of these animals by proper care and husbandry, or even figuring out what the care and husbandry should be. And then the basics of these animals, how we feed them, how we care for them, uh, and, and how we can be comfortable with them here so that when we wanna propose a study to an investigator that says, oh, I want us to do a large scale screening of something, we can say, hey, you know, I know you've always used, used rats or you've always used rabbits for that research, but you know, have you ever considered maybe using an invertebrate, maybe using something else to screen your drugs as a way to, to test toxicity before you move on to something else? And with that, thank you very much. <laughs> Here's my email in case you guys want it. I'm always happy to answer questions. Uh, if you guys want uh, me to send you any SOPs, any of my research, I'm happy to share that with anybody. Um, uh, Austin, will, I'm sure, will send out my email as well. Um, and with that, I will take any questions that you guys submitted during the talk. Thank you, Dr. Ernst. We do have a couple questions from the audience. How many of the invertebrates do you use at your institution that are covered by IACUC via approved protocol? So um, here at USC, uh, we do we do have cephalopods, which which are which do go through the eye cook. But as far as that goes, um, things like Drosophila and C. elegans, we don't typically put through the eye cook. And I haven't done I haven't brought any of my weird animals here at City of Hope, where where I did much of this research and where the ACS caging is and everything. We did. Um, put that through the IACUC. So we did it as kind of an abridged IACUC protocol. It wasn't a full protocol with a full review because nobody else on the committee really knew anything about it. And, and again, that's what I'm trying to promote here is that if we know more about it, we can facilitate those things. But it was a uh, it was in the form of a letter to the IACUC saying that this research was gonna be done. These were the species that were gonna be used. And like the guide says, in the guide, it mentions invertebrates twice. Um, in fact, Oh, yeah, there we go. So here are the two quotes from the guide. Um, and it says that basically, in summary, it says that whenever whenever possible, you should treat invertebrates just like you would any other animal. And so I said, you know, all considerations would be made to give them analgesics, give them proper care and treat them uh, just like any other animal whenever possible. And, and then as far as what other institutions do, uh, many other institutions do uh, cover all their invertebrate research and even some journals, definitely uh, almost all cephalopod journals do require that uh, that the research is put through an IACUC. And then um, even some countries like Canada uh, in, in include cephalopods and Europe include cephalopods in uh, their, their animal welfare laws. So they're required to be used. And then as far as the things that are considered a little bit under cephalopods like, like arthropods, um, we, uh, it, you know, I, I found that, that institutions will go will go either way. But I always recommend at least notify the IACUC of what's being done because we don't know whether they feel pain or not. But we should. Uh, it, it's better to assume that they do than to assume that they don't. Dr. Aaron's next question coming at you: How often do you miss the cages of your giant forest centipedes? The giant forest centipedes, um, we would miss them, and it depends how heavily you'd missed it. So for the giant forest centipedes, um, we would use water bowls as well. Um, so the water bowls really helped to keep the humidity, but we found that the ventilated rack would really dry out the substrate very quickly. So we even tried using substrates that held the humidity, uh, but we found that it would dry very quickly. So uh, we would miss them, I'd say, two to three times a week and have a large water bowl in there. Um, they would always burrow underneath the water bowl, which was convenient because that was kind of immune to the airflow of the rack. So it would it would stay more humid under the water bowl than it would in the rest of the cage. But yeah, several times a week uh, in order to keep it. We could have we could have actually unhooked the ventilation from the rack and just kept it as a static rack would have worked very well. But we had a lot of arid uh, animals that it would have ended up getting too humid with with the food and and everything else in there, so we had to keep the rack uh, ventilated. Dr. Ernst, here's the next question. How often and how much do you feed your tarantulas, scorpions, and centipedes, and are crickets sufficient nutritionally? 
Um, yes, we did just, we only fed them crickets while they were there. Um, many of you guys might be happy to hear, we did adopt them. Uh, we did adopt them all out afterwards. Um, very few of our studies involved any sort of terminal procedure. So we did adopt out to a variety of different people. Um, you know, we think about adopting beagles after research, but we adopted out many of our tarantulas and scorpions um, <laughs> after our research. But uh, so we did, the studies weren't all that long. They were only there for a couple months. And so for most of them, we would. Uh, for the very large ones, like that Goliath bird-eating spider that I had, um, it was really difficult. We would use uh, cockroaches. We didn't want to use, uh, uh, traditionally that animal would eat mice, um, but we didn't want to use any mice for feeding it because then we would have had to then put those mice through the eye cook since we're using them for food and they don't eat uh, dead mice. They only eat live prey. So uh, the crickets were definitely sufficient while we were there, but then some of the much larger animals, we had to use larger things like cockroaches and uh, worms for food. Dr. Ernst, here's the next question. To your knowledge, are any private toxicology companies using invertebrates as a precursor to mammal toxicology, toxicology evaluation related mostly to FDA approval? Um, there are some. I, uh, I recently found that out. So that's something that I've been kind of advocating for, and there are some. However, um, the very funny thing about that is you got to think about, and it's really exciting, and that's a great question, is that yes, it is being done, but we have to think about it from the angle of the pharmaceutical industry, that not only are they trying to pioneer these drugs, but they're also trying to pioneer ways to assess the drugs. So I can't tell you um, which companies are doing it, but I can tell you it is being done, and they're trying to optimize that process. And then what they can do as a company is they can sell or patent that proprietary process, even using a live animal, and they can uh, market that as a way of pre-screening drugs. So it is being done, and hopefully it's it's on the horizon, and, and, it, and it can decrease our, our animal numbers, our, our vertebrate animal numbers, once they figure it out. Here's the next question, Dr. Ernst. How do you ensure the substrate that is used is clean and free of parasites and or bacteria? Is it autoclaved first? That's an excellent question. Yes, uh, we did autoclave all our bedding. We were really worried about that um, because a lot of the bedding can even have, you know, uh, earth mites. They can have different things in it that not only were we worried about potentially infecting our invertebrates, but if, uh, if, if I brought in something in my soil and it somehow got into our mice, um, they would be quite unhappy with me. So we did, we autoclaved all of our bedding before we used it. And uh, we even went so far as that we would autoclave our complete setups, uh, just like we would with, with the rodents. We would we'd make our completes with whatever bedding was in there and we would autoclave the complete that way. I mean, it was, it was overkill, um, but, but at City of Hope, they, they do that as standard for all their, for all their mice, um, even immune competent or immune compromised. So uh, it was just easy to throw in throw in a rack of those and have them autoclaved. And so then anything we put in there had, had sterile everything. So it was excellent conditions uh, to do that research in. Dr. Ernst, we have one last question. Okay. What is the safest way to transfer centipedes to new cages? <laughs> uh, very carefully. Um, no, but uh, seriously, the anesthetize them. So the nice thing about the ACS cages is they have that little trap door on the back for the Lixit. So we would just take the, the isoflurane hose, which was perfect size, we'd put it in through the little hole in the back of the cage, turn on the isoflurane, wait for it to fall asleep or get mostly asleep. Um, didn't have to be completely anesthetized, just enough that we could uh, pick it up with tongs or something and move it into the other cage because they are, um, even feeding them was, was terrifying because they have such a strong feeding response is that the second you drop some food in, they'll grab it. And if you ever seen a centipede eat, They'll, if you drop in five crickets, they'll grab all five crickets with their different legs and they'll flip around and they're, they're very violent when they eat. So it was, that was hard logistically. So um, we might have to think of a way that we can try to optimize that to make those animals a little bit safer and, and reduce some of the uncertainty when we're trying to get into those cages. Because it, it was scary even for me to try to get in and try to feed those guys. Well, Dr. Ahrens, uh, thank you once again. You're welcome. And thank thanks you. to everyone who joined us today. Stay tuned in the coming weeks for the announcement of our next webinar. And until then, keep up the good science.